Well, thanks for coming this evening. Um, I just wanted to mention that we have a whole series, um, a lecture series, and a concert this Sunday, if you're interested as well. This is uh, Gershwin, so Brent Runnels, oh, it's going to be fun, um, is performing with three others in a jazz ensemble at 4 o'clock on Sunday. And we expect to have a full house here, so we'll have a little different, different rearrangement here, but um, trumpet, piano, bass, and um, and and trumpet, piano, bass, and something else. And I'm sure, that, yeah, I'm like glad that was recorded. What what? Tambourines. The tambourines. <laughs> something good. No. I'm, I'm very professional this evening. Um, and actually, our next. Uh, our next lecture will be Thursday the 11th, and that's um, Degas, the artist in his studio, with our own John Tolkien, so nice. that'll be exciting. But I'm very, very happy to have you here tonight, and you're going to do the intro. Be sure. Here. This is the unofficial intro, the welcome and the thank you. You guys have been remarkable, and uh, I should probably have tissues nearby, because I think I'm going to cry. Okay, <laughs> please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Spencer Shelton. <coughs> I serve as a program director for Heartbound Ministries. Uh, this is my mom, Andrea Shelton. Uh, in case you couldn't tell by the uncanny resemblance. But I appreciate you all being here. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, and we're so grateful to Oglethorpe for uh, allowing us to showcase the art here. Uh, it is a, uh, pr prison is a pretty, pretty terrible place. Uh, the food's not good. Everyone just is worried about their safety. Uh, I mean, COVID's just run through nearly everybody it is uh I, I go three times a week and every time i drive back i just sit in my car like just totally drained and we were able to go in and provide them materials to to make art and almost none of these guys have any prior training they've never drawn before they have zero self-confidence but uh through some nudging and uh encouragement and positive reinforcement we see the fruits of their labor and uh it is such an honor to be able to display their works and they are so proud um and we, we get all kinds of letters asking how many people have visited and and uh I, I took the little flyer that we distributed earlier this year down to uh the juveniles that i work with in uh burris county correctional or uh, burris correctional facility and uh i showed them what some of the other inmates have made and they didn't believe that People like them could make something like that. And then when I tell them where the funds go, I mean, they're just, now they're asking me to get them art supplies. Um, and Fred, who spoke at one of our events uh, a couple weeks ago and created art for us, uh, was one of our best artists in the past. He's going to now uh, take over my duty as art teacher at Burris. <laughs> so I will no longer be doing uh, ice cream cone drawings and sunsets. <laughs> so they will get some actual legit instruction. And we're super excited about that. But again, thank you all for being here. Uh, Andrea graduated from Oglethorpe in 1991. Uh, she serves on the Board of Corrections. Uh, and she was the recipient of the first Spirit of Oglethorpe Award. Uh, I think this is Heartbound's 19th year. Um, yeah, going on 20. And uh, I got to watch her in action at the uh, board meeting today. And it was very very evident that about everyone in the room is terrified of her because she is, uh, she cares and she's extremely passionate about this and she wants to change lives and make a difference. Uh, and without any further ado, Andrew. Okay. I love Oakport with all my heart. So I, I'm so honored to be here. I, I could cry, <laughs> and I probably will. Um, this university is where I met my beloved husband, Joe Shelton, and it is a university that even before we had the mantra of make a life, make a living, make a difference, it, we were taught to do that through this beautiful liberal arts education. So I have so much gratitude for this university and I can see y'all shaking your heads because you do too so thanks for coming and I am going to talk real quickly I promise about reaching children of incarcerated parents because that's something I'm 
very passionate about. Just to give you a little background, my brother was incarcerated. That's what introduced me to the prison system. He was sentenced to 15 years to serve seven at one of the prisons we now go to is uh, where he served. Fortunately, on appeal, he ended up being released afterward and was and served 16 months, but it's astonishing just what 16 months in that system can do to a person. And thankfully, he is free and has first offender status, so he doesn't have the big F for felon following him everywhere he goes. So he was able to return to a sense of normalcy, but it, it does change you. And, and what it did to me is I would go in these, this prison and see these children visiting with their loved one and think we have got to do something better because on in every prison there was this sign that said you're responsible for your children and you know they're, they're not allowed to get up they're not allowed to play in some facilities they weren't allowed to um, hug their parent which I always thought was quite absurd but it was it, it just made me think what a waste of time that we can't do something fun I always think life should have some fun to it. So we're not doing any fun with these kids. And then what's happening to them when, when they go home? So that's kind of what I want to talk about, our journey to reaching these children and, and just give you sort of a picture of what their life looks like. So here we go. So I call them the forgotten crime victims because what I always say is when one thinks of victims of crime, we don't think of children but they, they are victims. And one of them said, when we get locked up, our family gets locked up too, essentially. And it's, it's true. Uh, I'll just give you a little background. This is one of our incarcerated fathers um, just praying with his, his son. And, and it just was a precious moment that we caught on, on camera. Uh, here's... Here's sort of a, a national picture. One, you can read this for yourself, but one in every 12 American children, that's more than 5.7 million kids under the age of 18 have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives. I can't even think in those numbers. It's just overwhelming. Researchers estimate over the last five years, seven million children have experienced a parent in or released from prison and I used to say before I started doing this I didn't know anybody in prison I didn't want to know anybody in prison but when I think back in it on it I did know somebody in prison it just didn't happen to be a family member but if you think about it I bet every one of us knows someone who's been in prison or been locked up for you know in, in a jail or a detention center so this really is a problem that I think people are hesitant to be transparent about, especially children. It's very, there's a lot of shame and stigma tied to admitting that you know someone in prison and it's your family member. But these are these are the kind of numbers we're dealing with. And, and then nationally, one in 28 kids have a parent in prison. Sadly, for African-American children, it's one in nine. I think for Hispanic children, it's one in 12. So these are some bleak, numbers but i promise it gets better uh this is this is one that astonishes me as well approximately two hundred thousand georgia children have uh, a parent in jail prison detention center some sort of situation like that i've watched that number rise over the years of 19 years of doing this it's just astonishing how that number has gone up and the thing that I, I really want people to know is that these are some of the most vulnerable children in our society. They have higher rates of just about anything negative you can experience. Um, and here I just spelled out a few, you know, anxiety disorders, withdrawal, depression, truancy, uh, teen pregnancy, aggression, social phobias high school dropout rates, um, you name it. It's, that's the reality for so many of them. And that is a reality that gravely affects their ability to 
function healthily in, in society, right? <clears throat> and let's see, right? Oh, this, this I'm going to admit, this, some like to debunk this. They say, no, 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 that can't be true. But I, you can search the internet, and <laughs> I have found this to be a reliable source for some very good um, stati statisticians is that children of incarcerated parents are five to seven times more likely to end up in prison themselves. And we don't want to say that because it stigmatizes children of incarcerated parents, but I know Spencer can probably attest, but I meet people in prison all the time, and there's a common theme among many of them, and it is parental incarceration, particularly the father being incarcerated. And so I see all that, and I say, okay, we've got an urgent need here. We've got to intervene. We've got to do something. And so I want to talk real quickly here um, about how we can reach them. But before I do that, well, I might jump to this one. Well, no, I'm going to jump back. I may have jumped too much, actually. Nope. Okay. I'm going to give you a, a little more background because I like to bring it home for us. In Georgia, when you're released from prison, you receive $25 and a bus ticket. I, I think they've done away with the bus ticket, unfortunately. But that's, they will give a bus ticket if you absolutely can't find somebody to pick you up. And you gotta have the clothes on your back. And so think about that, what you would do if you had a felony conviction and someone handed you $25 and a bus ticket and said, don't come back. Um, in all likelihood, you probably will come back. In Georgia, about 67%, two thirds of, of, of them recidivate after three years. The biggest challenges uh, to incarcerated people once they're released, anybody want to guess? Housing, getting a job. Housing, getting a job. Those are the two biggest. Mm -hmm. The job thing, ironically, is getting a little bit easier because everyone's hiring right now. So I've been talking to returned citizens who are able to get jobs at Amazon and things like that. I'm like, okay, yeah, but they can't find housing. That's the big one. Uh, a lot of apartment complexes will not let you live there if you have a felony conviction. So transportation, that's a big one. So you may get out and you don't have a driver's license anymore. You don't even know where your driver's license is because you left it behind 20 years ago. You got parole and probation requirements, and we have we have a Becky here who went to Oglethorpe and it was a retired federal probation officer, and I thought that was fascinating. But she could probably stand up here and talk all day about that. Um, but that that's that's a hurdle, and you have to pay when you're on parole and probation. You have to pay fees. Um, I'm going to digress one second and tell you my funny funny story. Uh, as a Buckhead mom. I was taking Spencer and a friend to school one day and got pulled over for going through the stop sign. I did not go through that stop sign. Uh, so that was, that's what I said. I did not go. Can I just keep going? No. Um, so I decided I was going to fight this thing. I, I'm an attorney. I, I can fight this thing, you know. So um, I went to court, you know, to, to plead, but, you know, guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And then you have to come back. And at, while I was in court watching everybody else in this courtroom and thinking, oh my gosh, people are just pleading their rights away and they have no idea, um, I was watching many of them being treated very, very late by a bailiff. So I wrote a letter to the mayor, the judge, you know, to address this issue. And I was treated really, really by, by the bailiff. So. That did not make the judge happy, and she recused herself. Okay, fine. And then I thought, well, I'll just ask for my case to go to state court, because they're going to throw this thing out if I go to state court. Well, they didn't throw it out. That never happens. So suddenly, I'm going to state court, where, again, I plead not guilty, but the officer showed up. And if you know anything about law, once the officer shows up, I mean, you know they're going to take his side. And so I get up on the stand, and I'm like, <laughs> Dear Judge, I know you're going to take his side, but I promise you, I did not. I did not run through that stop sign. But I and I'm fighting this because I believe I did not run through that stop sign. So I go to sit back down, and he says, 
Miss Shelton, I believe that you believe that you did not run through that stop sign. Uh -huh. But you know I'm going to have to side with the police officer. It's like, uh-huh. He goes, but when I was up there on the stand, I said, could you just give me community service? I had so much, I could do so much community service for you, much more valuable than a fine. The fine was pretty steep. He goes, so you know what? But I am going to give you community service. And oh, oh, the prosecution stands up. It's just like TV. Slams <laughs> her hands down. I object, Your Honor. And I went, who objects to community service? <laughs> well, she did. He overruled her, though. So I got community service. <laughs> she leans over and goes, well, you know you're going to be on probation. I said, yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't know I was going to be on probation. <laughs> I had no idea. So suddenly, I'm on probation. Hello, Buckhead Mom. Um, and I tell the kids, which they thought that was hilarious. Their mom's on probation. I'm like, I'm on probation. And Joe thought that was hilarious as well. I have to go report to a probation officer until I complete my community service. I, and if I don't, I have to pay these fees. And I go to the probation office. It is the sixth degree of hell. I'm telling you, it was horrific this one in particular, and um, kid you not, Jerry Springer's on the television, you know, people will have their kids with them, and I said, you know, can we have this program called Little Readers, could we bring books so people could read to their children? No. Okay, okay. So anyway, I got a taste of what probation looks like, and if you're not savvy, and if you don't have resources, you could quickly get sucked down that tunnel. And you get behind on your fees, and then you, you know, a technical infraction. I mean, who knows? What if I didn't complete my community service? It just boggled my mind. I thought, oh my, this is uh, really hard stuff if you're not well resourced, if you're not supported. So, anyway, I do, I, um, and ironically, I was being vetted for the Board of Corrections by Governor Deal's office at the time. <laughs> So I, one of the things I said to the judge, I was like, excuse me, I'm being vetted to be on this board. And he goes, Michelle, I don't think he's going to care about a stop sign. I was like, okay, thank you. Uh, but that is my probation story, and it is nothing compared to the real world, right? Um, but I, it gave me a taste, and I got a picture of what, I mean, you have to take off work and go to probation office. I mean, you think your employer's going to like that? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. So anyway, that is also one of the challenges. It wasn't such a challenge for me because I have a great support system. But if you don't, I could see how that could be a huge challenge. So the other thing, uh, most of these prisoners aren't returning to Buckhead, Wayukateras. They're returning to, these returning citizens are returning to very toxic environments. And according to some of the recent statistics I looked up, um, 12,000 prisoners are released each week. That's, that's quite boggling. And that's, George, that's in state and federal system. And formerly incarcerated people have a death rate of 3.5 times, they're 3.5 times more likely to die within um, two weeks let me see. No, they have a death rate that's 3.5 times higher than the general population. And then within two weeks of release, they're 13 times more likely to die. And that is from chronic health issues, murder, suicide, and overdose. So uh, this, is, this is what these children are living through with their formerly incarcerated parents. Uh, not to mention what they're living with and through while their parent is incarcerated. So just because your parent gets out doesn't mean everything is going get, to get all better, right? Um, and so that's a snapshot of, of the lives that these children um, live. And, I, and not every child, but I've, I've met a lot of these kids, and, and I can tell you it's, it's not easy. 85% um, of them live at or below poverty level in Georgia. So uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, often it's the father in prison, so the mother's left to not only care for them, but she's got to 
provide a job because maybe the main breadwinner is gone. I mean, it's just so, so, so hard. So here are some of the things that we have found can directly impact these children. Mentoring, if um, you are interested in any of these, please talk to me afterward. Um, support groups for children and caregivers. It's really hard for caregivers. Parenting training, both inside and outside the prison. We have a parenting program that I'll talk about in another slide, but huge proponent of parenting training. And, and I can tell you more why I am. But, uh, literacy programs, transportation to and from prison. I know of one ministry in the metro Atlanta area that, that drives, uh, will take children to visit their incarcerated parent, but in the state prisons right now, children still can't go in due to COVID. So we are going on almost two years of these parents being separated from their children and the children being separated from their parents. It's, it's really unthinkable. Tutoring, because as we mentioned earlier, a lot of them um, have academic challenges, but just from the environment. And you know, when one parent's gone, that only leaves one parent to read a story at night or, or to help with your homework. And that parent's probably just trying to put food on the table. And then visitation centers for parents and children. And that's another thing that I'll go into more detail because that's something that Heartbound does. Uh, so my favorite, my baby, that I like to talk about when it comes to Heartbound is Little Readers. One of my board members like, you put too much text on there. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> but um, you can either read that or listen to what I'm going to say. But I'll just give you a, a brief. Little Readers is a program that I just thought, oh, it's like eating oatmeal. It's just the right thing to do. We, we've got to reach these kids to change literacy outcomes, because if you don't know about the literacy rate of Georgia, it's abysmal. So we go into these prisons, and we have a tripod and a camera very much like that, and we bring in books, and we teach these parents how to read to their kids. And it is the most joyful moment, and we take that recording, we put it on a uh, DVD, which people are like, what are those? But um, the reason we do that is because you can still find a DVD player at the Goodwill if you don't have one somewhere. And so we found that still works for us, or you can put it in a laptop. And then we send the book along to the child and the New Testament and some other resources, uh, like nutritional resources and where to find help for this and that, that the, the adult can, can utilize. Put that all in a package and we send it to the child at no cost to the parent and no cost to the caregiver. And it is beautiful. Uh, we got a letter, I think I brought it in. Um, you've got, you printed it, Elizabeth. I it. But I think I have it right here. Okay, good. Uh, I got it. Uh -huh. But um, I'll end with this letter, but I, I, I'll, it'll tell you the impact that this program has on People. And it'll also tie in a little bit about this art museum here, this exhibit here. So, if you ever are interested in this, please let us know. We, we just train you to flip open a camera and to love people well. And just show up and show them that you care and teach them how to read with enthusiasm. For most of our parents, it's the first time they've ever read to their child. And they are so nervous and it's so adorable. <laughs> I always tell the man, if you cry, that's even better. Uh, because it's just so touching to me to see a grown man cry because he's reading to his child. But that's how much it means to them. But they're they're so nervous, and it's it's just completely gratifying for me to see them excited. And I, I tell them, I'm like, you you know all this when all these chemicals were going off in your brain when you're reading to your child. I mean, you don't need to do you don't need to do drugs. The dopamines you can get that from reading to a kid, and they're like, "What?" So it's really, really, really exciting to see this. And we we go in uh, during COVID. We couldn't go in, so we started donating equipment to the facilities, video training staff on how to do it, and then they send us the little SD card, and we take it from there. So we were able to reach 980 children last year, which is pretty remarkable. Um, not our usual numbers, about half of what we usually reach in a year, but 
we were pretty excited to be able to reach 980 during a global pandemic. Um, all right. The other program we have is Malachi Dads and Hannah's Gift. And when you saw that picture of the father praying, that was at a, um, an event that comes with Malachi Dads. So these are faith-based pro programs. A lot of what we do, we bring faith in it. It's not a requirement that inmates have any faith to participate, but we that's just, that's just where we come from. And so they have weekly meetings, and it equips them how to be fathers and mothers and leaders. And I think this next one, okay. Excuse the crassness, but this is what one of our chaplains said about the program, and it is so true. Malachi dads transform sperm donors into spiritual fathers and husbands. And yeah, he was like, we got enough sperm donors. I was like, yeah, we do. Um, you know, we, I mean, it's easy to make a baby. It's a whole other story to raise them. And so we're teaching these men to take responsibility for their children. We're teaching these women. It's not that you have to teach the women as much, honestly. They want to take responsibility for their children, but they have to break a lot of old habits that were passed down to them. Uh, there is so much generational brokenness I see in incarceration. So anyway, that's what we do. And there's another one of our dads with, our, with his kids. What we do is we have this thing called Returning Heart Celebration. If you want to do one volunteer event your whole year, this is it. It's usually in April, and we bring the dads that have been through the program. And you don't have to be through the program, but um, we'll give you at least some tips before you come to the event. They're, they're all vetted, and we invite their children to come on the prison grounds for this celebration day, and, and I mean, it's jumpies, it's ponies, it's cotton candy, hot dogs, snow cones, anything I can, petting zoo, I brought in a petting zoo before, anything we can do, we try to do, and we re reunite them for this day, I call it the blessing of normalcy. Who doesn't just want a day of normalcy? And so we do that on the prison grounds, and it takes a ton of volunteers so if that would interest you of course we didn't get to do it in 2020 we didn't get to do it in 2021 we are hoping and praying we're going to get to do it in 2022 we do it at walker state prison which is up in rock spring about two hours from here the inmates at walker are the ones who actually did the art in the gallery next to this one they do that art as part of our Art for the Inside show, knowing that the donation of their art will generate income for the ministry to support the Little Readers program. So by their gift of art, they know that they are sewing into the Little Readers program and allowing children to see and hear their incarcerated loved one reading to them. So I believe generosity breeds rehabilitation. And these men get to be generous. And they have so little to give. So when they can give their art, it's just incredible for them. And we'll come back to that. But this, um, I love this quote. He said, this program's helping me learn to be a positive influence in my daughter's life. All the things you take for granted go away once you go to prison. But the kids shouldn't have to suffer as a result. A day like this is so important to them. One of my favorite stories is about a dad. I love this guy. He's about to get out of prison. He is so close. He's in a, a transitional center right now. But his name's Jeremy. And his, he met his daughter, who was probably, I'm going to say, 11 at the time. The first time he met her was at Returning Heart Celebration. He had been through the Malachi Dads program, reestablished contact with the birth mother, and she agreed to send her baby girl into prison to meet dad. And so I walk, I'm walking through the gymnasium and I see this little girl just kind of like this, and her dad, you can tell, he's like, you know, I don't know what to do. And, and um, I just walked by and I said, is that your daughter? Said, yes, ma'am, it is. Oh, she's beautiful. And I took my, my little fingers and I raised her chin. And I said, oh, just look at her. Well, she broke out in a grin. He broke out in a grin and goes, she is, it, and she? So I got to affirm her, which was easy. And he got to affirm her. Well, that set something in motion. 
that girl is now in college. Um, it's, it's just been incredible. I'm not sure she would be in college today if it hadn't been for the fact that that relationship was with her father had been repaired. And it, it started building self-esteem in her that um, she just began to flourish. And so every time, every year when we would have returning hearts, she'd bounce over, so excited, because people remember when you were kind to them, when, when you said to them, don't they? And um, every year I got to just say all over again, isn't she beautiful? And that dad was the proudest dad in the world. He is the greatest dad now. Oh, my gosh, he worked so hard in prison to be the best dad he could. And so it's been lovely to see that relationship be restored. There's a picture. Uh, this is Colin Prince. Uh, that's that's his, his last name. But he, um, that's the first time his daughter got to come and have fun in a prison. See, that you don't get to come and have fun in prison. And she, and look at the look, I mean, look at the look on his face. He's just absolutely overjoyed. He picked her up and held her up. It was like the Lion King. Um, and all the volunteers were just crying away. And that's, that's what it looks like. And I'm going to leave you, uh, before I read this letter, with this. This is what a corrections employee said to me. We complain so much about these 90s babies, and she's referring to, to people that were born in the 90s, coming into the prison system. But if we do not make some changes and take some efforts to change the lives of our offenders, we will, the children of our offenders, we will soon be dealing with turn-of-the-century babies. Um, and we need to step up and help change lives. Well, I can tell you, we're dealing with turn-of-the-century babies now. Um, it's been, been a few years since she made this quote, but, you know, I was in prison today with some turn-of-the-century babies. I mean, yeah. 15 to 18-year-olds, three of them had life sentences. Mm -hmm. I can't wrap my head around that. I'm not excusing what they did. Please don't think that. But um, they're, they're kids. And... Um, I dare say I didn't do a statistic with them, but I've done it before. I, I remember being in a room with 35 juveniles, and three had a father in the, father figure in their lives. And do the math, 32 didn't. And you know, I thought, well, there you go. I mean, it doesn't mean you're going to turn out one particular way just because you don't have a dad. But it's certainly you need a, a parent in your life, a mother or a father, somebody that's going to help you. And these kids come, through, come from some circumstances that you and I probably can't even fathom. And I, I talked with the Commissioner of Corrections today, and he was saying how when he was a counselor, he, he would meet some of these families and just couldn't believe it what he was seeing, and, and, and it's it's just so true. So, and I know we're, we're, I'm dealing a lot here saying fathers, 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 because most of the people I meet in prison are men. Uh, 50, I think it's 50 point, about 52% of them are fathers of the males. With the mothers, it's about 81%. So we do a lot with moms, too. Uh, one of the things we do is we sponsor a children's visitation center here in the metro area at a transitional center. It's a beautiful room that we furnished, and it looks like a place you'd be happy to hang out in your own house. And it gives those kids that normalcy. When they come visit mom, it's in a, a natural setting. It's like It doesn't feel like prison, and they get four hours of just normalcy with mom. Right now, they don't get that because of COVID. And so um, we can't wait to start that back up again. But that's another thing if you're, you know, in terms of volunteer opportunities, if you ever wanted to do that, we'll sign you up. Um, an interesting side note, I know I've talked a bit about faith tonight. Why faith? Well, I, you know, I have my own personal faith, but what we have found is if we take a program, but it, and it also has an element of faith, because here's what I believe. We get, a lot, we get a lot of our morals from faith, right? What we have found is the inmates themselves are 
60% less likely to reoffend if if they are deeply engaged with their faith and they're 50% less likely to return to prison. So that's that's why we just know that faith works and so that's it's part of our core values for for our ministry. And I'll give you just a couple more things and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, the cost of housing an inmate in Georgia on the low end is 17000 And what we've got, I think today, it was 45,000 inmates. Typically, once the courts open up, it's really open up, it's going to balloon. But typically, we see about 53,000 people incarcerated in prisons. I'm not including jails or detention centers in Georgia, 53,000. So if one of these programs changes just 1%, 530 incarcerated people, changes their outcome, keeps them from coming back to prison, then that's a savings of about $9 million to taxpayers. Seems like a really good deal to me. <laughs> uh, and then you can do the math if just 10% of these individuals are changed, just 5,300 inmates, then we're looking at a, at a savings of almost $90 million to taxpayers. So it's in everybody's best interest to have these type of programs because 95% of incarcerated people are coming back to our communities. Right now, 70.6 of the people in Georgia prisons are considered violent offenders. Governor Deal did a lot for criminal justice reform. His big thing was let's lock up violent offenders, let's let the other ones sort of remain in the community and see what and divert them to programs that can help them. Um, and then you add everything else and we've got, we got a lot going on. I'm um, gonna wrap up with two things. One is a video and I see it on the laptop but I don't know that I can make it play. But let's see, is it the next one? Oh, oh there it is, I'm pointing at the wrong thing. Okay, I wanna play you this guy He's a grandpa, and he was our first Little Readers recording in history. Uh, this was, I think, 2014. Sweet man, just to give you a little background, had um, paranoid schizophrenic, and that's led to a crime that uh, ended him up in prison. But he is medicated, he's healthy now. But he is our first reader, and I'm going to show you what Little Readers looks like. Um, which one do I hit? You got it? Maybe. This is great, man. I've been through a long time. It seemed like forever for eternity. On one day, uh, that granddad hoped to be that with you. And uh, in the meantime, I found this special ministry that has allowed me to be able to read a book to you. but he's just talking and we've learned a lot since our first recording we were able to approach corrections when new administration came in and said could they wear free world clothes at, from here up so they're they look like everybody else's mom or dad and they let us so now we have a backdrop the inmates made us a beautiful backdrop so now they get to they get to wear a free world shirt they have a backdrop so hd cameras we have, we have HD cameras. Oh, this is a young person. It's very important that we have good technology now. Um, so anyway, that that is what that looks like. And and again, the sale of the art over in the other gallery. And there's also a bargain bin over here. But it benefits this program. And if you want to see more videos, you could go on our um, 
on our website, which is heartboundministries.com. And I'm going to end with this letter, and I might cry, so I hope I don't. But it's going to be the first time. Dear Heartbound. See? Okay. Thank you so much for all of your help. You've done so much for me, even though I don't deserve it, and I've asked for more than I could possibly ever repay. You and everyone with Heartbound give us the incarcerated hope. You build family relationships, and you create opportunities. Your ministry has a multifaceted effect on the lives of people. It helps build broken relationships of parents and their children through returning hearts and little readers, which in my book is a very powerful ministry and truly honorable. Your ministry gives people in prison hope by allowing them to see that there are people in this world who truly care for their well-being in spite of their past. You all even give artists a stage to show their work, and that same stage allows them to assist in your ministry. It allows us to be a part of something that has an awesome impact on an innumerable amount of people. It's nice to be recognized for our talent and to receive monetary awards to boot. We send a monetary award for our winners this year. Well, surprise, we're going to send a gift to every artist who exhibited in this show. Our board made that decision two weeks ago. Uh, but the real satisfaction for me is when I send art is when I send artwork, um, I hear results of what your ministry does, and knowing in my, all, my own small way, I helped. Which brings me to a story I'd like to share with you. I'm a mentor here at Walker, and part of what I do as a mentor is to be a sounding board for people when they have issues they want to talk about, stress they need to clear, or even when they just want to celebrate a win. Whatever they need, I'm here for them regardless of what I may be feeling. So there's this one guy who just transferred here around four months ago. He's been worried about having a relationship with his son. Little man is what he calls him. As you can imagine, it is difficult being a parent while incarcerated, especially when the child is very young. It is important for a parent to help build the child's foundation and build a positive relationship with them. He hasn't seen his son in person for a very long time. Thank you, COVID. However, he was able to take part in Little Readers. Well, recently he called home and found out his own son had received the recording of him. He said with tears in his eyes and a smile on his face that his son had been watching it over and over that day. His excitement was out of this world. As he walked away, I thought about how little readers affected his son, his life, his family, and me. The reason I put myself into the list is because I know that in some way my artwork may have helped bring him and his son that happiness. I know that it takes so much more than what I've contributed that even if it is only a small percentage of the total contribution, at least I know I helped a fraction. You gave me that opportunity to help and I greatly appreciate that. Thank you, Lewis. If you want to see some of Lewis's art, he did a, the Chadwick Boseman it, did the prints, I mean some incredible stuff. He could be the elephant over there. Either the elephant or the rhino. I can't remember. Um, but that's rehabilitation. This is the guy that you're okay with coming out one day and being your neighbor because you know that's rehabilitation. And so there are others like him, I assure you. And we're just one organization and a few individuals that wake up every day and say, what can we do to make this place better? And that is what we're trying to do. And by making our prison system better by rehabilitating people. We make Georgia better. We make society better. We break generational cycles of crime and incarceration. So with that, I want to thank y'all so much for your kindness in um, being here. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me later or um, ask Spencer. And if you ever want to go to prison, and I always joke with them and say, y'all are dying to get out. I'm dying to get in. I love going to prison. Uh, we'll take you. I know Barb, Barb's husband's been to prison. He comes with our Christmas bag program and distributes Christmas bags. Um, but, yeah, um, we'd love to have you. We'll take you. So, thank y'all. That's it. You got any questions? Any questions? You don't have to. How much has the program grown in the last 19 years? Like Heartbound? Oh my goodness, it's so funny. I, um, 
It's grown a lot. Um, I remember our first donation was $50. My mom gave it to us to help pay for gas <laughs> so we could go to prison. And uh, I remember looking back, I think our, our budget the first year, which was 2003, was $5,000. And now yeah, uh, we have, right before COVID, close to $400,000 in operational costs. And there's only two, two employees here. We do. Um, we do have some contractors. We provide trauma counseling at the women's facility at no charge to the women. So there's cost of that. We provide some prison chaplains and facilities that don't have them, like our juvenile facility without um, Chaplain John, who also served as a chaplain here at Oglethorpe and whose daughter went to Oglethorpe. Um, these boys would not have a chaplain. And then Chaplain Omar, who you're going to hear from in one of these speaking series, um, but yeah, we've grown. Um, I thought we were just going to be this little tiny thing that did some advocacy work and helped put some, bring some faith into the um, lives of people. And now we, we have a plethora of programs. Uh, we've expanded to Tennessee in terms of um, that we've now done little readers in Tennessee, Louisiana, uh, and um, which is. Louisiana houses the, the country's largest maximum security facility at Angola. And if you want to read a terrific book, read Kane's Redemption. It's a story about a, 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 a warden who made incredible change. Um, and he's now the uh, commissioner for Mississippi prisons. But we, we it, so it's, it's grown a lot. Um, and I never thought it would be anything more than just this little, little side thing. And uh, funny how that happens. I'm, just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I think part of the reason I was goofing off when we first started is that this just hits so, it, 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 it hits so close to home that I feel vulnerable, honestly. Because um, you know I'm a foster mom and I deal with, oh my God. You're an amazing foster mom, by the way. <laughs> no, but so, I just, I can tell. Well. I try, um, but I deal with and work with um, usually moms because dads are frequently absent, who have often have records and uh, was led into this whole experience because of a criminal defense attorney who's a friend, mm -hmm. who who had a client who had a felony record, who was going to, who was heavily pregnant and who was going to lose that baby into the system, yeah. and so we made an adoption plan which fell through and we followed her into the system. So I feel like every, it's interesting, because you started this because of your brother, and um, I'm sorry, I'm so emotional. <clears throat> every, oh my gosh, sorry, I, I just don't talk about this very often, but every um, adoption, every foster moment, everything comes from, from a broken place into something else. I can't, sorry, I can't form the words here. And what you guys do, is so remarkable to try to knit people back together. It's, it's overwhelming. It really is overwhelming. It's, I mean, uh, if I could pull myself together here, you have a seminary, you're teaching people, you've got a divinity school, you do Malachi dance, you do these reunions, you, I assume you work with DFACs to like have the, re, you know, visitation. What you're doing is is just astounding to me. Well, what you're doing is astounding. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I can't even like clearly <laughs> keep it together here, but um, I'm so grateful for, this, for sharing this with us. Thank you. And this is this is why I was being a goof off before because <laughs> I knew I couldn't get the words out. You know, I've also been lucky enough, and I feel like it was a privilege to serve on a grand jury for a murder trial, and I was one of 12 people who put someone away. And the piece that I remember the most was his kids testifying that they saw mommy, daddy shoot mommy, and thinking, where are those kids? Today, yeah. Where are those kids? Mm -hmm. So, a little bit heavy. Yeah, it is heavy. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, no, I, 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 I get that, and I'm, I'm a big goof. Oh, too, because I have to be. <laughs> you have to balance out the way of the world. Either that or it's this. Yeah. yeah sorry. Um, and, and one of the things I'll, I'll brag on Elizabeth, we needed, um, we did art classes for uh, incarcerated pregnant moms at Metro at Helms facility here in Atlanta, and we couldn't go in. And 
And Elizabeth volunteered and taught art online to these incarcerated pregnant moms, which is wonderful. I, you talk about, in my opinion, pregnancy is bad enough, but <laughs> throw it in prison. I mean, where you have in, in boredom and lack of nutrition and separation from your support system. I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming to me. And so to be able to bring a little bit of um, joy into these women's lives, uh, to, we're, we're partnering with another organization uh, called SOAN, and we're, uh, um, they're going to be doing lullaby uh, workshops with these women. So they're going to learn how to write a lullaby for their um, unborn child, and they're going to record it. So when their child is born, they will have this lullaby at home. Um, and, you know, some people don't get why we do this. They just don't, and I get it. I mean... They, they, there are people that say lock them up, throw away the key. <clears throat> you know, I remember AJC did a story on little readers, and I naively thought I'd read the comments. Oh, I was like, okay, never, no self, never do that again, uh, because people were like, oh, these people have no right to read to their children. I'm thinking, Wait, did you not get this? Is, what about there's a kid here, okay? Um, so never read the com, never care what people say about you, right? <laughs> um, rule number one, uh, but it's, it's. Whether you care about people in prison or not, go back to the fact there's a child and <clears throat> too many of them are going to fall into either foster care or prison or you name whatever, uh, any vulnerability you can imagine. And so um, it, takes, it takes a village, right? We've heard that. And so I'm proud to, to be part of the village and I'm look out here and I know there's people in this room that support what we do and um, praise God you do God's work there Elizabeth being a foster mom wow so any of <laughs> yes in 2005 the Alumni Association named you to be our first Spirit of Overboard Award <laughs> winner and I guess this program was about two years old at the time mm. uh, um, uh, Heartbound was yeah we didn't even have little so, readers yeah oh, so yeah. this was the inaugural you were doing on that five thousand dollar budget or maybe a two thousand dollar budget but i think back to that you know not having any idea how much of an impact that you have continued to make and you're still making a difference so i'm really proud of you thank how you many, how many thousands of people do you reach you, reach you? Uh, you boy, that's a, that's a hard that question yeah um i mean i could i could break it down by program um Gosh, I haven't, you know what, I haven't even sat and thought about that. Um, I used to be, letter. yeah, there you go. <laughs> I used to be really good at tracking numbers, but if you know anything, I'm an Enneagram 7, so I'm like a squirrel on coffee. I'm like, woo, what's the next thing we can do? You know? uh, and I don't stop to go, okay, maybe we should track that. Um, I have a tracker now, so this was like, we're going to track that. So it's so good, it rains me in. Because I'm just kind of like, oh, we just do a lot, a lot of good. Um, and so some, sometimes I'm really good at tracking it, and I, but I don't know the number off my head. But I mean, I, you said yeah. But we do work with 33 prison facilities in Georgia. So yeah, and there's right now 45,000, you know, we're not reaching them all, of course, but um, in some way, we've got a touch point in every facility because we're providing little readers to every facility in the state of Georgia that wants to record. Mm -hmm. um, our Malachi dads, we, we will provide that at no cost to every facility in, in the Hannah's Gift, those kind of programs. We sponsor Returning Hearts at Walker, but you know, we'll do, we'll do Christmas bags. Hopefully this year we, we'll be able to get in and distribute some Christmas bags um, that have hygiene and other care items. And, uh, we typically reach about 5,000 just through that, the bag distribution. Now, I have, that's a good, that's a good newsletter right there, Barb. You're right. Um, and some years I'm good at it. Show but, the impact of your gift. That's yes, you yes, do. yes. That's what I have to do and the other beautiful thing, Spencer has done a good job. He breaks down the cost of things. And I mean, to, to little readers, to send a book and, and a DVD. I mean, this is, what, for ten less than 10 bucks, you can... It's like yeah, I mean, not with postage, but yeah, you know, you have some postage on there. It, you know, we're less than ten dollars, and you can allow a child to see their parent every night when they go to bed um, and read along. Game changer. So, yeah.
I'm so curious. What is it like dealing with the administration and the department of Like, <laughs> and, this, and not to get you on a tangent or anything, but no, no, I no. wonder, I'm just curious how it is. That's the biggest, that, that's the hardest part. I like when you started. Maybe. Yeah, I, I um, when we started, oh my gosh, it was so, it was hilarious when I look back on it, because I'm tenacious. And, and I remember uh, just trying so hard to advocate for change in the prison system. And I would, I would just dog the governor. I mean, I was like, I'm at his heels, you know. And one day, um, so this would have been in 2003, I was exhausted. I tried everything I knew because at that point, the state was going to eliminate prison chaplains. And I thought, this is absurd. The very person that can help change a life, care about people, you're going you're gonna to write them out because of budget cuts. So I ended up going down to the governor's office and said, I need to meet with him. And of course, they put me on what I call the crazy couch. For the people that just show up think they can meet the governor, you know? And uh, they put me on the crazy couch. And one of his staff members came out and I was like, I need to talk to the governor. And I started bawling, of course, when she took me into the lower room. And she's like, you know, you, you do. He needs to hear what you have to say. And so I sat there for five hours on the crazy couch and finally got an audience with him and persuaded him not to eliminate prison chaplains from the system. Um, so it's, it's always been either a legislative or agency battle. Um, my first internship here was Knippenberg helped me get an internship with, at the state capitol. That, is, that was incredibly useful. It taught me how to navigate the legislative system and advocate for change in the, in the system. And eventually, um, Governor Dale put me on the Board of Corrections. Uh, so I'm tenacious, and I will outlast you. That's kind of my mantra um, with, when dealing with people that, are that can be a barrier to good. And there are people like that in the agency. And you can imagine after COVID, it's, uh, one of my board members put it this way. It's like we've all been out in our pajamas for a really long time. Now we need to get our suits back on. Some people don't want to put the suit back on. It was like, oh my gosh, that was really easy. We just locked people down and didn't let anybody come in, right? And so it's like, okay, ready to come back in. Um, so, we'll, you know, we've got a good commissioner right now who cares and, and he listens. And if you um, are not a good, we will we will just outlast you. That is how that's why I believe. And we will we will just keep persevering. So it's um, it's interesting. It's it's challenging. But uh, Nacy Sedera, he who never gives up, right? Is that the mantra? Uh, that's the isn't that what the Latin? Oh, yes, that, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I can't pronounce it correctly. It's exactly it? what Mr. Eason said. Yes, is it he who never gives up, or uh, don't even know how to give up, or she? She, she, yeah. she gives up. Who doesn't yeah. know how to give up? Who, who did, yeah. So that's Nesky. No, that, you just there you go. That's another thing I learned from Oglethorpe. <laughs> Didn't know how to pronounce it, but I know what it means. Oglethorpe never gives up. I mean, yeah. So, anything else? Yes. Um, I wondered how literacy uh, plays into this. Uh, do you have some parents who would have difficulty doing the reading? Yes. Yes. So the average reading level of a Georgia inmate is fifth grade. And, and we did learn when we started this, you know, I'm a little bit naive. I just thought everybody could read a children's book. They can't. So we have, you know, we have some books that might have just two words in them, like duck, mm -hmm. duck, moose, you know. Yeah. When we, we learned we need to provide picture books in case someone just, you know, we, they don't want to admit they can't read. So we're like, oh, you just talk through the pictures, you know, just talk. And yeah. one of the really one of the moments that wrecked me was a mom who couldn't read to her children but we another another woman offered to read for her and so she would just sit there and turn the pages and talk and the and her friend would read for her that one wrecked me to watch because just the compassion of that one woman to see um, another human being in need and thank you I'm gonna help you read to your child. It was beautiful. So it, it is a it is a challenge, and, and I'm constantly harping at, at corrections of um, we've got to do a better job at helping uh, literacy rights within prison. But really, all this starts in a cradle, doesn't it? I mean, we have to we have to 
better educate our children here in Georgia. We just have to, if we want to see change. There, the prison, I mean, the, the school to prison pipeline is a real thing. And we see it all the time. It, Spencer works with a group of juveniles that, you know, 15 to 17, 18 years old, and some of them can't read. You, if they write, you would think maybe a first grader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just shocked. What happened? So, yeah, it's it's a real problem. It's my passion to help us be a more literate state. All right. Thank y'all so much. Y'all been so kind.